So when he went back to Iran, what he was writing about was why can't we have a modern philosophy that incorporates the best of Islam with the best of these new currents of Western thought as epitomized by the philosophers in France. And I think when we were all young, or certainly when I was a young man, I was beguiled by the sort of thought coming off the left bank in Paris. People like Sartre and Camus were my heroes. And he was saying, why can't we do that back in Iran? And more to the point, why can't we reorganize our clerical institutions along progressive lines like the Catholic Church in France? We find that strange. But, don't forget, the same Catholic Church was capable of allowing, not willingly perhaps, but it was the source of liberation theology, the fighting priests of the Latin American resistance movements and revolutions came out of the Catholic Church. Someone who is one of the world's great ecumenical thinkers, Hans Kuhn, came out of the Catholic Church, even though he was threatened with excommunication and the loss of his university chair uh, for calling the Pope fallible rather than infallible. This is the kind of image that Shariati took back to Iran. And this is what animated an entire generation of both secular, liberal, and left, and radical people, and also religious people. So the origins of the so-called reformist wing of the clerical movement owes as much to Shariati as the secularists who also fought underneath the banner of his teachings and which led to the Tehran Spring, which I was talking about at the beginning of my discussion with you, and which nobody here in the West knows anything about. So when the reactionaries in Tehran attacked the university and make an object lesson of bullying, beating up, and killing some of the students, this was a very, very good reason in case the Tehran Spring should arise again. When it does, it won't be something that is pro-Western in the way that crude American strategists would hope for. It will be something mixed, something like Shariati hoped for, a fusion of different influences and far more cosmopolitan than anything that we have managed to achieve here in the West. Because we are very, very monocultural. And even those who are, as it were, dissenters against the way our governments conduct themselves, particularly internationally, are very monocultural in the way that we consider how the world should be. What the book is about is a very long disquisition of how this should not be the case, particularly among people who think, people of the left, even people who have liberal persuasion and, and who imagine themselves in one way or another as cosmopolitan, people who like world music, people who like, as it were, the different fusion cuisines that you can now sort of get here in London, or even people who just like dining at a different so-called authentic ethnic restaurant every single night. You can go to two very fine, uh, as it were, Ethiopian restaurants uh, here in Caledonian Road, on the opposite ends of the road, uh, the one uh, just nearest to us, Addis, has the better stocks of Ethiopian wine. Uh, we would not have thought, actually, in Sicily, but very closely modelled on Italian wine, uh, given uh, the history of attempted coloniz colonization of that country by the Italians underneath Mussolini. But what you've got is, in this particular country and in this particular city, a whole range of separate cultural movements and communities, which we all pay lip service to, and very often we go to the festivals of these different communities, and that's about as far as it goes. We don't actually try to dig much deeper. So there would be very, very few people on the left, for instance, who've actually taken the trouble to read the Quran. And for that matter, very few people on the left would have read the Bible. So that the whole question as to the contest between scripture is something which means nothing to most people who regard themselves as worldly and left and resistant of the dominations of the world as they currently stand. And if we can't understand these things, how can we understand the cultures of other people who probably understand us better than we understand them? Let me give you an example of that, how they understand us better than we understand them. The revolution in Eritrea has been, I think, now 
betrayed, I say that advisedly, I have a personal stake in that. A number of my friends who were leading soldiers in the liberation struggle are now in prison without trial. They're not going to be released. Uh, two of them are husband and wife. Uh, he was a young general, uh, very much in charge of the uh, field forces of the liberation movement in Eritrea. Uh, she was a fighting female soldier. And we got drunk one night in Asmara. And this is a, a foul concoction which is very, very deceptive. It's uh, fermented honey wine. So it tastes like syrup. It tastes like this thick honey. And it takes a long time before you can get it to go down your throat without gelling and sticking in the back of your throat. Uh, and of course, I found a very novel way of making sure that it did go down by mixing it with gin, <laughs> which meant that by the end of the evening we were all completely and utterly numbered. Uh, but my friend began to laugh and said, Stephen, you know, my wife and I, we never, ever quarrel. We never quarrel. And he was laughing quite hysterically by this stage because he'd never tried a national drink with gin either. Uh, and I said, well, no, Petros, why does your, why do you and your wife never quarrel? And in that typical sort of almost liberated but not quite fully liberated, still residual male fashion, he burst into hysterical laughter again and said, this is because she can shoot straighter and faster than I can. <laughs> the whole idea of feminism here in the West allowed the advent of the first genuine female fighting forces in the liberation movement in Africa. That was an idea they imported from us. So that when the war came to an end, the female soldiers did not want to be demobilized. They wanted to stay in the liberation forces and become part of a new regular army because for the first time in their lives they had found an institutional platform in which they could be, as much as possible, equal. They did not want to be demobilized into a society which had not yet caught up with the way of looking at the world that the liberation forces had adopted and certainly had not yet adopted in the broader society the feminist ethos that was present within the liberation forces. If you went to Eritrea in those days, it was really funny. All the guys who had just come out of the army had Jimi Hendrix hairdos. Uh, this was not traditional. Uh, they grew them like that because they admired Jimi Hendrix. So a black American was their inspiration. And they went up into the mountains uh, to fight against what became the Derg, the Stalinist government of Mengistu. And they took with them the zithers. Like everyone is big on kora music now, the harp that comes out of West Africa, from Mali and from uh, Senegal. If you've not heard kora music, uh, it's truly beautiful. 